Hey, what's up guys? My name is Achana and welcome back to my C++ series. So today, we're gonna to be talking all about templates. And I know that you guys have been requesting this for a while, but it is kind of an advanced topic, so I didn't wanna jump into it too quickly. But today, we're finally gonna start off with a fairly gentle introduction to templates in C++. So first of all, what is a template? Well, those of you familiar with other languages might see this as kind of generics, right? So in Java or C Sharp, they're kind of called generics. Templates are completely different. Well, they're not completely different, but they are like infinitely more powerful than, than generics in those managed languages, right? Templates are almost like a bit of a macro. They let you do pretty much anything, whereas generics is very heavily limited by the type system and by a lot of other factors. Gen uh, templates specifically are inc uh, much more powerful and we're gonna see this as we go along. Don't worry, I'm gonna probably end up having like dozens of videos on templates or something like that. So by no means is this gonna be the only video I make on templates. Templates are such a huge and complex topic and can be incredibly crazy. So we're gonna be exploring all of that as the series goes on. So first of all, well, what is a template? A template basically allows you to define a template that will be compiled but like by your usage, if that makes sense. You can get the compiler to write code for you based on a set of rules. That's really what a template is, just the compiler writing code for you based on the rules that you've given it. When I write a function, for example, and I use a template in that function, what I'm actually doing is creating almost like a blueprint so that when I decide to call that function, I can specify certain parameters which determine what code actually gets put into the template. And that is all kind of determined by the way that I actually use that function. Again, it's a little bit difficult to explain. And in fact, I could just give you the definition that's on like CPP reference or on Wikipedia. I'm trying not to do that, obviously. I think the best way is just gonna be to show you what it actually looks like in the code. So a good example of why I might want to use a template is if I want to create a function that is largely going to be the same, but may take in different types. Maybe I have a print function that I want to use to print integers. So I might do something like print int value, and all this is gonna do is see out my value. And if I go back down to main, I can call print with a value such as five and everything will be fine. Now, what if I wanna actually use a string there instead, like hello? So suddenly I need to actually define another overload for this function, which actually takes in a string. So just like this. Note that I'm actually passing the string by value here because I want to kind of have it be the same as my print function here, which also takes in the integer by value. Then I'm going to basically end up copying and pasting this code. This works fine. In order for this to actually compile though, we do need to include string. Now, what if I want to print a float? Well, you kind of are seeing the picture here, I hope. If I want to print a float like 5.5, then I also need to basically copy and paste this function again. So now I have three different functions here which basically the only thing that changes here is the actual type of data I'm passing in because C out can of course accept any kind of primitive or, or built-in C++ type that we're actually using here. So what we've ended up with is manually defining three different overloads for a print function. That's okay. Some people actually prefer to do it this way, but what if we could just define that function once? A good goal for software engineering in general really is to kind of avoid code duplication, right? Because if we decide to actually change one of these print functions to do something extra, or suddenly we decide to go from using C out to print F or one of our own custom logging functions, we have to change it in all of the places that we've actually defined that, right? So in this case, in all three print functions, we have to actually adjust the code. What if we could just write that code once and then somehow be able to fill in the blank for the type? That's where we can use a template. So instead of writing this code this many times, what I'm actually going to do is just convert this into being a template. The way that we do that syntactically is before the return type, we write template, then open an angular bracket, type name, and then give it a name. Typically T is used. And then finally we can use T instead of our actual type over here. So this becomes void print t value. And suddenly, if I actually compile this code by hitting control F7, you can see it compiles just fine. And if, in fact, if I run my code by hitting F5, look at that, all three, all three functions actually work, even though we've just written one function. So how on earth does this work and what's actually happening here? Well, the first thing that gives away that this is an actual template is, well, the word template. 
right? This means that this is a template that will be evaluated at compile time. So basically this is an actual code. This isn't actually a real function. This only gets created when we actually call it. And when we call it based on how we call it with what types, does this actually get created and compiled as source code? Now this next part is something called a template parameter. In this case, we've chosen to use type name as the type of template parameter, and then T as just a name. So this could be anything. We could call this type, we could call this churno, we could call this anything we really wanted to. And so what happens is this specific variable name, this template kind of argument name, we can use that throughout our actual template code to substitute whatever type in this case gets used. So what we've done is instead of just writing int value like that, where we've written T value, which means that when we actually call this code, whatever type we specify here is the type that actually goes into this argument. Now this is a little bit harder to read in this case because we're not actually specifying the type explicitly. It's just kind of getting it implicitly from the actual parameters here in this case. But what we can do is when we call print, we can actually specify using angular brackets here, the type that we want. So for example, print int. In fact, let's just get rid of these and keep it real simple for now. So what we've done here is we've called the print function with the type int. This, this template argument here accepts a type name. Now you can also write this as class, by the way, it is exactly the same synonymous, right? Class, class type name. I tend to use type name because class by just reading the code class kind of implies that it has to be a class type. That's not true. As you can see, this code still compiles even though I'm using int. So because of that, I tend to just use type name because it just makes more sense. So we write type name T, which means that the first template argument that we have here is an actual type. So we can write int here, we can write std string, we can write whatever we want. Obviously, if we write std string, then what actually happens is T gets replaced with the type that we've specified, std string, which means that we are obviously are taking in a string value hence why this code is not compiling. So we'd actually have to write something here like churno or something. Now, if we go back to our five example, we can specify int here, but we don't have to. If it's possible for the type to actually be worked out by the argument that we use here, either by the return value, which, we'll, which we can talk about later, or by the actual parameter here. So in other words, C++ knows that five is an integer. It can automatically deduce what type T should be, which is why we don't actually have to specify it using those angular brackets, which makes our job even easier. Now, that being said, let me show you explicitly what actually happens. If you do not write anything, so I'm not using this print function at all. This print function does not really exist. This print function is just a template, which actually gets created when we call the print function with a given template argument. And I can even prove this by making a syntax error here. So let's just say instead of value, I forget, I don't know, the E or something. So I'm just printing value. Now clearly this is an error because there is no variable called value. So if I hit control F7 to compile my code, look at that, it compiles just fine. And that's because the template doesn't really exist until we call it. If I go back to my code and I actually try and call print with like the value five or something and hit control F7, at that point, you can see I actually do get an error here telling me the value is an undeclared identifier. And again, that's because the template only gets created when we actually call it because it's just a template. It's not actual code. It gets materialized, I guess, into real code that gets sent to the compiler and compiled based on the usage of the template. Now, MSVC won't tell you about errors in templates that you're not actually using. Some compilers like Clang actually will, so it is kind of compiler dependent. But in this case, you can see we don't actually get any errors. We've written code that's not really correct, but until we call the template, it doesn't exist, so we don't get any compile errors. So what actually happens when we compile this template is it knows in this case that we've used five here, right? Which means that the type name is actually an integer. So what happens is it basically fills in the blanks here. So it would be equivalent as to if we just copied and pasted this method and then replaced T with an actual int, because that's what we're calling here. And now this is a real function that has to get linked and everything when we actually compile and link this code. So let's just fix that syntax error we had there. And that is actually what happens in this case. Now, when we call print with a different argument, like a float, for example, another version of this template actually gets created. So this gets copied and pasted. And then instead of T, this time we're using a float. 
So you kind of get the picture. Really, all this is is a template specifying how to create methods. And these methods or these functions can be created automatically by the compiler based on your usage of them, which is pretty cool. Now, templates are by no means just limited to types or anything like that. And they're not limited to functions either. You can actually create entire classes based on templates. And in fact, that's a lot of what the standard template library actually is in C++. It's just completely using templates. Let's take a look at an example where we're not actually using a type as a template argument, and let's do it for a class instead of for a function. Let's just get rid of this print function that we've created over here, and let's create a class. Suppose that I wanted to create an array, but I wanted this array class to actually be created on the stack. So what I basically mean is, let's just create a class called array, and then over here, maybe it's an integer array in this case, I actually want to have an array that has some kind of size that is determined at compile time. Now, I can't just kind of put in a variable size or anything like that, because since this is a stack allocated array, it actually has to be known at compile time. Now, obviously we could use alloc a or something like that to grow the stack dynamically. We're not gonna use any of that in this example. We just want to basically create a normal kind of C style array on the stack. So this size value does in fact have to be known at compile time. Now templates are evaluated at compile time. So this is perfect. What I can do is convert this class into being a template, but instead of using type name as, as my template argument, I can actually use just an integer, right? And I'll call this N, which is basically just stands for number. And then instead of size over here, I'm going to write N. And then finally, I'll just add one public function to this array, which is just going to return the size of the array. So I'll write int get size, and then I'll just return n, okay? So what's going to happen here is exactly the same thing that actually happened with our function. When we call this array and we specify a size like five, and I'll just call this array, what happens is it this code gets compiled based on its usage. So in this case, five is the template argument, which means that a version of this class gets created which replaces n with five, like that and like that. So this is actually what we end up with. This is the code that we end up with. And then of course, if I call array.getSize here and print that to the console, I'll get rid of this extra copy I've created here. That's my code, let's hit F5. You can see that I get five printing. So that's how it works. So you can see that we don't just have to use types. We can even use integers or other data types to basically specify how we want to generate a class, an entire class in this case. Let's go one step further. Suppose that instead of this being an int explicitly, I'll, I also wanted to make the type actually variable. So I wanted to be able to specify what type this array actually contains at compile time. Well, I can add another template argument. So let's add this one before the number. So I'll just write type name t and then int n, right? So now I'm going to replace this int with t and suddenly what I've got is an array of type t, which is specified at compile time by the template that is of size n, which is also specified by compile time. So now over here, when I actually call this array, I have to specify int as an example and five for my size. And I can obviously change this to be anything I want, like std string and 50 or whatever. And you can see that what I've created is kind of a class that gets automatically created every time I actually use this array. So that's pretty cool. And what we've actually created here is very similar to how the standard array class actually works in the standard template library that's in C++, right? It just has two template arguments, type and size, and it creates an array very similar to the way that we've actually done it here. Now, this is a sort of meta programming in C++ because you can see, instead of actually programming what our code does at runtime, we're kind of programming what the compiler will actually do during compile time. And this is extremely powerful. Now, what we're doing here, I think this is a pretty good kind of gentle introduction. We've even kind of gone as far as to create multiple template arguments and use integers instead of just kind of type names. But this is just scratching the surface. I mean, this can get really crazy really quickly. And because of that, I kind of want to talk about where you might want to use templates and where you might not want to use templates. So this part is kind of entirely subjective. It's opinionated, but in my experience, this is, this is how it works, right? So first of all, a whole bunch of game studios out there or software companies, whatever, actually just outright ban templates. They say, never use templates ever. Now I think that's a little bit kind of overreacting to the situation because I think the templates can be extremely useful for situations where like, I don't know, like a logging system or something like that. You have every possible type that you want to log. Do you really have to like specify an overload for every single function? 
Well, you can automate that with templates, right? You can get the compiler to write code for you based on a set of rules. That's really what a template is, just the compiler writing code for you based on the rules that you've given it and based on the usage of that function or class or anything like that, right? That being said, if you start using templates, if you start getting really, really complex with your templates and you start just having it generate an entire like meta language for you, and I've seen code that would probably give you nightmares. Like seriously, you can go really far with templates. That might be pushing it, right? That might be going a little bit too far because there's a point where the templates become so complex that if there's an issue with it, no one can understand what's going on. And it, and you literally have to just get like a notebook, get a piece of paper and start filling in all these types manually. Of course, you can get the compiler to actually tell you what code is generating and all of that. But even so, like at work, we've had cases where we've just had to sit down and spend three hours figuring out what code is actually being compiled and what's going on with our templates and why they're not working. When that happens, I think you've gone too far and I don't think that you should get too crazy with templates, even though you can. There is a point where doing things manually and writing out code yourself is actually going to benefit you and your team a lot more than trying to create this massive template magic that just does everything for you, but is kind of fragile and very difficult to understand. So I don't think the templates should be completely banned, but I also don't think that you should go crazy with templates and abuse them a lot. Anyway. We're gonna have a lot more videos about templates because there's a lot more that I wanna talk about. This is just scratching the surface. Once we actually get into kind of the game engine series as well, we'll, be, we'll start to see real examples of where we might want to use templates. Off the top of my head, I think two kind of really important places where I would definitely use templates are things like logging systems and also even like a material system, like for rendering graphics, right? When you have a uniform buffer that can contain various different types, templating that to an extent can be extremely useful. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, you can hit that like button. You can also, you can, you can help support this series and all the series that I make on here on my channel by going to patreon.com forward slash the channel. Massive shout out as always to all of the wonderful supporters that help make this possible. There are some pretty cool rewards that you can get such as access to all the source code from my OpenGL series, as well as the soon to come game engine series. By supporting, then you also get, like for, for the top tier supporters, we do this thing where we basically hang out for an hour once a month and we just talk about whatever. The next one's actually coming up in like a week. So definitely sign up for that if you're interested. And then also you'll get videos early and a whole bunch of other rewards. But most of all, you're helping to support the series, which is awesome because I can basically just let me make more videos. You can also join Discord. I have a Discord server over at theshadow.com slash Discord. That's basically just a community of people where you can talk about whatever you want, including this programming stuff, and just discuss it with other people, ask for help with your code and all that. Definitely encourage you guys to join that. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Goodbye. Thank you.